Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our physiology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about the stomach, the small intestine, the pancreas, the liver. Today, we'll talk about the colon and the defecation reflex. About 1,500 ml of chyme is gonna reach the colon every day. The colon will reabsorb most of this because there are many valuables in the colon, such as water, sodium, chloride, etc. The remainder is going to end up as feces pieces. We talked about the trilaminar embryo before. The mucosa of your colon is made from the endoderm. The blood vessels of the colon are derived from the mesoderm. How about the enteric nervous system and the nerve supply of the colon? That is ectoderm. Here is the anatomy. Easy stuff. The colon starts here at the ileocecal valve. Ileocecal. Here is your cecum which literally means blind ended. And this is your lovely appendix. This is the ascending colon, transverse colon, and descending colon. You can also call them right versus left colon. Sigmoid colon, why do you call it sigmoid? Because it looks like an S shape. Do you remember the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve? It had an S shaped graph that looked like this. You can say S shape or you can say sigmoid. Since the sigmoid looks like an S, it's called sigmoid. Rectum, which means straightforward. Case in point, your abdominal recti muscles. They are straight muscles that go downwards and upwards. And then the anal canal. Most of your stool is stored in this area right here until you go to the bathroom. Your colon is very important anatomically speaking because the proximal part of the colon belongs to the midgut, but the distal part of the colon belongs to the hindgut. That's why the proximal part will be supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, but the distal part will be supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. The proximal part will be drained by the superior mesenteric vein and the distal part by the inferior mesenteric vein. As for lymph node drainage, they follow the names of the arteries. How about the nerve supply? The midgut is supplied by cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, which came from your brain. The hindgut is supplied by the pelvic nerves, which comes from the spinal cord, sacral segments S2, 3, and 4. All of that was the parasympathetic. As for the sympathetic nervous system, the midgut is supplied by the greater splanchnic nerve. The hindgut is usually supplied by the lesser splanchnic nerve. The proximal part of the colon belongs to the midgut. That's why any inflammation here or any problem here is gonna lead to a pain that refers to here, the midgut location, the periumbilical area. Case in point, appendicitis. Conversely, the distal part of the colon, the hindgut, if it has a problem, this pain will be referred here, downstairs. Case in point, diverticulitis. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. But what if I have something in my stomach, like an ulcer? Epigastric pain, because the stomach is part of the foregut. The sympathetic nerve supply to the colon, proximal part comes from the greater splanchnic nerve. The distal part of the colon is supplied by the lesser splanchnic nerve, lower thoracic versus lumbar. But the parasympathetic nervous system is craniosacral, which cranio is going to supply the colon. The vagus nerve will supply the proximal colon. How about the distal part, distal to the splenic flexure? That will be the pelvic nerves, sacral segments two, three, and four. Draw a line in the sand between the proximal colon and the distal colon. This line is between the proximal three-fourths and the distal one-fourth of the transverse colon, near the splenic flexure. The demarcation between the proximal and the distal is not that clear. And this is where the superior mesenteric artery branches end and the inferior mesenteric artery branches begin. So this area is very vulnerable because it is receiving blood from distal small blood vessels. So if I had a car accident and lost tons of blood and developed extracellular fluid volume depletion, this area will be extremely vulnerable to ischemia. Now proximal colon versus distal colon. Who supplies the proximal colon? Vagus nerve. How about the distal pelvic nerve? All of this was parasympathetic, which is the hero of the digestive tract. How about sympathetic? We have greater splanchnic versus lesser splanchnic nerve. Function of the proximal colon? Absorption, mainly. 
function of the distal colon storage mainly in fact the ability of the rectum to store stool in it is impressive it can store a lot of feces distension of the rectal mucosa is what triggers the defecation reflex giving you the urge to go to the toilet anatomically speaking the ascending colon is usually wider in diameter but the descending colon is usually narrower in diameter that's why if a cancer develops in the descending colon it's more likely to obstruct because it was narrow to begin with and when i obstruct what's going to happen constipation which is a very common symptom of colorectal cancer not just that but the caliber of your stool will be so different because of the obstruction how about the proximal colon who is the hero of absorption well this is very wide wide open tons of blood vessels and that's why it's more likely to bleed as a colorectal cancer leading to iron deficiency anemia in fact if you have an old patient with iron deficiency anemia, this is a gastrointestinal bleeding until proven otherwise. Oh, by the way, let me digress for a second. Did you know that you can tell the difference between a patient who eats cheap meat versus another patient who eats the expensive stuff? Just by looking in their stool. But that's a story for another time. Why do we need the colon? Here is the story. The function of your gut is to digest and then to absorb. You need to digest first in order to be able to absorb. What if I did not digest and therefore did not absorb? What's going to happen to the non-digested, non-absorbed food? Oh, all right. These particles will end up in the stool. Thank you, colon. There is something important that you need to be aware of. In the anal canal, well, there is the anal canal proximal to the pectinate line and an anal canal distal to the pectinate line. Why do doctors make a big deal about this? Because embryologically speaking, they were different and the nerve supply is different and the internal sphincter is involuntary, but the external is voluntary, which is different. The internal sphincter is autonomic, but the external is somatic. Their blood supply is different, their venous drainage is different, their lymphatic drainage is different, and their nerve supply is different. Just like your urinary bladder, you had an internal urethral sphincter and an external urethral sphincter. The internal is still involuntary, but the external is voluntary. Autonomic versus somatic. About one and a half liter of chyme per day is going to enter your colon. Most of it will be absorbed into the bloodstream, especially sodium chloride and water. Tons of water will be absorbed if this did not happen all of that water will end up here causing diarrhea colonic purge which is very rapid movement will give you no time to absorb water and you'll end up with diarrhea okay medicosis so what's in my stool mostly water and some solid particles and don't forget some electrolytes what do you mean by solid particles undigested unabsorbed food or let's say material to be more technical dead bacteria bile products sloughed epithelium from your own gut and much more who's responsible for the natural brown color of my feces stercobilin and to some extent urobilin don't forget that urobilin is the source of stercobilin if you remember my bilirubin lecture and who is responsible for my distinct stool odor well your magnificent odor depends on the type of bacteria that lives in the colon and the type of food that you eat so not only do you possess a fingerprint you also possess a farting print this is an exaggeration in my video on the small intestine we talked about this pause and review the large intestine is similar but not quite the same begin with the end in mind what are you trying to achieve i'm trying to absorb tons of water because i do not want diarrhea this water is valuable it can return back to me okay but you need to attract it by osmosis okay i will actively absorb sodium which means from the gut epithelium to the blood this is what absorption means and this is active transport thanks to the primary active sodium potassium ATPase pump. Sodium to the blood, potassium goes to the opposite direction. So you're absorbing sodium, but excreting potassium. This is especially enhanced under the influence of the hormone aldosterone secreted by the zona glomerulosa of your adrenal cortex. Under aldosterone's command, you will absorb more sodium to the blood 
and secrete more potassium to the stool. Cellular metabolism is all about taking oxygen in and releasing carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide plus water, which is everywhere, will give you carbonic acid, which will dissociate quickly into the acid and the base. The base should go to the stool, to the lumen of the colon, to neutralize the acidity made by your natural colonic bacteria. Your colonic bacteria produce carbon dioxide, which is an acid, hydrogen gas, which can dissociate and give you protons, which are acids, as well as methane. Back to the sodium story. Who's going to follow sodium? The positive um, chloride, the negative, yes. And who's going to follow salt? The water, because salt attracts water, hashtag osmosis. There is a symbiotic relationship between you and your colonic bacteria. The bacteria will take some of your food and eat it. There is some bacteria in the small intestine as well, not just the large intestine. The good news, the bacteria will give you some vitamins, especially vitamin K, B1, B2, and B12. Okay, medicosis, I've heard before that newborns are deficient in vitamin K. Yes, because the moment you were born, your gut was crystal clean with no bacteria. It was a brand new gut. You have not eaten or drunk anything from our dirty contaminated world yet. So you did not have bacteria in your colon and you were vitamin K deficient, relatively speaking. But don't worry, few days later, the colonic bacteria will make some vitamin K for you. Next, the defecation reflex. What was the structural unit of the nervous system? The neuron. What's the functional unit? The reflex arc. Afferent, center, efferent. But let's get more elaborate. First, you need a stimulus, which stimulates a receptor, which will be carried as a nerve impulse through the afferent, which goes to the center, which means brain or spinal cord. Then we have efferent, which leaves the central nervous system and goes to the effector organ to elicit a response. What's the stimulus for the defecation reflex? The presence of stool in your rectum causing rectal distension. Remember that pressure equals force over area. The more the stool reaches your rectum, the greater the force, the higher the pressure in your rectum, which stretches the wall of the rectum, which will tug upon mechanical receptors. They will feel the distension and they will tell the pelvic nerve to tell S234 segments of your spinal cord that we need to poop. And then the efferent is still the pelvic nerve. It will take the impulse from the spinal cord and back to your colon and rectum. The effector organ are the smooth muscles of your rectal wall. Response is contraction of the smooth muscles of your rectum and expulsion of the feces species. This reflex is present in everybody, even newborns. But as you grow older, you acquire another skill, the ability of your cerebral cortex to tell your spinal cord, you know what, this is not socially acceptable to poop right now. You are driving a car, grow up, you should wait until you find a commode. When you're in the bathroom and socially acceptable, it's time for you to detonate. Here is a very important tip if you want to decrease the risk of constipation. Please never ever ignore the natural urge to poop. Do not say, oh, oh, I, I do not feel like it right now. Let me just wait for a couple of hours and then I'll go to the bathroom. If you decide to go to the bathroom after two hours, uh, the urge would have been gone and it will be more difficult to get the stool out. When you first hear the urge to definitely just go for it when it is socially acceptable of course sympathology of the colon as you know the colon should absorb water back to the blood if you absorb less than you should you will end up with more water here in the stool leading to diarrhea if you absorb more than you should then your stool will be so hard and you will get some constipation and hard pellets will pass your colon's capacity to absorb water is about five to eight liters of water per day which means your colon can absorb up to eight liters of water per day however if i have cholera cholera is a nasty gram negative bacteria that releases all kinds of toxins in my gut these toxins will make my intestines secrete tons of water more than 10 liters every day this will exceed my colon's capacity to absorb that water all of that water will end up in the stool and i will have severe diarrhea this can be life-threatening due to extracellular fluid volume depletion which can lower my effective arterial blood volume which can lead to hypoperfusion 
which is half the textbook of internal medicine. The poop can tell your doctor a lot. Normal poop should be like this. Thank you, Stercobilin and Eurobilin. If your poop is dark like this, it's hemolysis, or it could be upper GI bleed. If your stool is covered by bright red blood, this is lower GI bleed. If it's kind of in between, well, it's not black, it's not red, it could be coming from anywhere, could be upper, could be lower depending on the circumstances and depending on how fast your intestines moved. Why does it matter if it's upper or lower? Why is there, there is a color difference? It's all about acid hematin in your stomach. If your stool looks like this, greasy and oily and smelly and it floats on the water in the toilet bowl, this is steatorrhea. We talked about this before in this physiology playlist. And if you have very pale or clay colored stool, this is post hepatic jaundice or it could be hepatic as well. The legend has it that an old senescent surgeon asked the nurse, yo, Tiffany, what up? You know that patient that I operated on? Did he fart after surgery? <clears throat> I mean, did he pass flatus? To which Tiffany replied, this is not your patient, this is my patient. And yes, he farted. And the surgeon did not take it personally. The surgeon smiled because now this patient is less likely to develop paralytic ileus. If you want to learn about paralytic ileus and the difference between it and small bowel obstruction, download my surgery high yield scores on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. I also have a renal physiology course. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionandus, where medicine makes perfect sense.